Okay, excellent. This morning has begun. Sweet. All right. Good afternoon, class. Uh, if you cannot hear me, please let me know. Um, I'm going to start off by uh, explaining that Linnea has uploaded uh, a, some practice exam questions into your course folder that has been shared with you. So some of the uh, some of the examples of, of the questions that you might be asked on exam one are provided in that folder for you to look at. And also that when we're going over these slides and you're studying, you sort of know what kinds of things to be looking for as far as studying. So let me know if you have any questions with that. But that has now been provided to you in your folder. All right, and with that, I am going to move into the lecture five, uh, where we're going to start talking about some more advanced fishes. So, uh, you know, we're going to be talking today about the, the bony fishes, the, the less derived bony fishes. We've already covered hagfish and lampreys here. Uh, we talked about chondrostii, which included the chimeras, the ratfishes. We talked about sharks, the elasmobranchs. Uh, also, then we talked about rays and skates. And so we've covered all the, the chondrichthian fishes. And now we're moving into osteichthys. And osteichthys is the bony fishes. Uh, Oste means bone, ich is fish. So today we'll be talking about dipneustii. Uh, the crossopterygii are the uh, lobe fin fishes, and the dipneustii are the lung fishes. And we're going to move up here into chondrostii, which includes things such as the sturgeons. Uh, and then we'll talk about the gars and the bowfin. So these are the, the lesser derived bony fishes we'll be talking about today in this lecture. Uh, and then uh, we'll move on later into the, the remaining teleosts. Uh, in the future lectures. So, you know, the, the textbook uses this term teleostomai. Uh, I like to use the term osteichthys. It, it sort of makes more sense to me, uh, bony fishes here. We're looking at total about 24,000 species in 435 families. And uh, this is really the largest group of vertebrates on the earth. Some of the major characteristics here of all these fishes that differentiates them from the, uh, the chondrichthian fishes and the agnathan fishes we've already talked about is primarily uh, bone. So opercular and pectoral bones. So pectoral bones meaning that pectoral girdle that, that supports the fins. And the opercula are the bony plates that cover the gills. So like the bony operculum here that covers the, it's really a gill plate. Uh, you sort of see this on these fishes because underneath this are the gills and so it's a protective device. Um, another major feature here is the gas bladder, sometimes called the swim bladder. Sharks, we talked about chondrichthian fishes do not have these. Uh, uh, they use uh, uh, oils and things like that to help with their buoyancy. These osteichthian fishes have an actual swim bladder. In some cases, this is used for buoyancy. In other cases, we'll talk, it's used for breathing air. And so these fishes actually will breathe air. Uh, they are capable of doing that. And it's not just the lung fishes. There's actually a lot of other fishes that can do it. The gars, for instance, have limited capability of breathing air as well. So there's lots of diversity here. And so if you look at all these fishes here, these are all bony fishes. You've got things like this here that look quite a bit different than this and then you've got these advanced uh, fishes here that look quite a bit different, for instance, the, from uh, these lesser derived fishes here. So lots of variation amongst these, these groups here. But really looking at bones, pectoral fin bone series, the operculum that protects the gills, and then this swim bladder that helps with buoyancy and also uh, the ability to breathe air. So when we look at some of the major anatomical features, and we went over the, a lot of these in lab last week as well, but just to reiterate some of these things, a dorsal fin, adipose fin, caudal fin, caudal peduncle, anal fin, pelvic fin, 
and then the pectoral fin is here. Here is your operculum. Again, that bony plate that protects your gill. And if you look at this, here's a cutaway. The gills lie just behind it. And bony fishes have four arches on each side compared to the five to six or seven gill arches in a chondrichthyan fish. There's a lot of features here also that are specialized. For instance, some fishes have these, what we call barbels, uh, mental barbels are on the chin. Sometimes they're on the nose. Uh, these are oftentimes involved in sense of smell and taste. Here's our eye there. Um, and this again gives some of the internal anatomy, which we'll get into later in the lecture. But in particular, I want to show this swim bladder. This is the swim bladder here that's either used, it either attaches to the esophagus and can be uh, filled with air when the fish comes to the surface and gulps. And it can be filled with air, which uh, makes the fish less dense. And so it more, it's more uh, uh, buoyant. Or it can be used literally to, uh, for breathing. Just like uh, you use your lungs for breathing, uh, the fish can oftentimes use these swim bladders for breathing as well. And so there's a couple different types and we'll talk about those as well. But this is where that swim bladder is inside of the fish. And those are the major uh, anatomical features here that we're gonna be concerned with for the bony fishes. When we look at that swim bladder, uh, these are some example uh, uh, diagrams of what those swim bladders look like or lungs. And these are some example uh, taxa that have those structures. So when we look at some of the, uh, the, the simple ones, right? Uh, teleost or chondrosteans, they're typically breathing water uh, and pulling oxygen out of the water using gills. If this is sort of the esophagus, there is uh, there's a there's a place here where air can be diverted from the esophagus into the swim bladder, and it can be filled. And there's oftentimes a muscular sphincter here that can close to keep the air from coming out. And so these fishes will use this literally uh, to, for buoyancy. When we look at uh, some fishes that are capable of air breathing, which includes Lepizosteus, which is the gar, and amia, which is the bowfin, we can see that there's a lot of surface area on the inside of this swim bladder. And so not only can it be filled for, to help with buoyancy, but uh, this, this surface area here allows the fish to pull oxygen out of the air that it's inhaling. And so these fishes have what we call limited air breathing. They cannot fully live outside of the water, but if they're in a low dissolved oxygen condition or in backwaters, uh, they can actually get a little bit of air in and strip oxygen from it so they can gulp at the surface. Uh, the dipnoi here are the ac actual lung fishes. And again, just like with, the, uh, with these holosteans, there's a lot of surface area here on the inside of the swim bladder. This is effectively a lung. Uh, this is really designed primarily for uh, air breathing. And so this is, uh, some air breathing really is, in some cases, these are obligate air breathers, in which case they require this lung. Uh, I said in the lab that lung fish can actually drown, believe it or not. Uh, they're designed to breathe air, uh, especially the Australian, uh, or the, uh, sorry, the African lung fishes. And so this is an actual lung. And then we look at some of these other uh, things like uh, amphibians, and then us terrestrial animals here, you can sort of see that Again, we have this, this sac that sort of is divergent off our esophagus, uh, and it is designed primarily for, for breathing air. And so when you see this surface area inside, this looks pretty much no different than that of the dipnoi lung or the holostean uh, swim bladder, which can function both. So the swim bladder is analogous to the lung of terrestrial vertebrates. That's a, it's a evolutionary thing. Your lungs are the equivalent to the swim bladder of a fish. And so they're just used for slightly different purposes. We look at uh, air breathing in fishes. You know, for instance, if we look at a, a, a lung fish, they breathe by coming to the surface of the, of the water here, and then they literally gulp air in through their mouth. It goes into the lung. And then they inhale in that manner. And then they can exhale as well, where the air then comes back out. 
when you look at their circulatory system, it's plumbed just like you'd see in a terrestrial uh, vertebrate, where you've got your heart pumping uh, blood to the lung, and the oxygenated blood then goes to the, the, the rest of the systemic circuit, you know, to the other tissues of the fish. So these things function just like a terrestrial animal that breathes air. And, and they, in fact, are called lungfish, for instance, because they, they do breathe air. So this is a uh, major adaptation here. It's really the invention of the lung. Uh, most fishes ended up changing that strategy to use it uh, for buoyancy control. But we do still have a lot of these relic fishes that do breathe air. And they're usually the more, what I'd say, less derived taxa. So we'll start off by talking about a few of those taxa now. So first one here, class Sarcopterygii, the lobe fin fishes. Really, we're looking at this for your exam. Family Letomeridae, the coelacanth. Look at this thing here. These are, in many cases, they've been called the missing link, so to speak, because these are living fossils that share a common ancestor with basically the beginning of tetrapods. So uh, land moving creatures. And so these lobed fins here, they have seven of them. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They literally are lakes. Uh, these are fleshy appendages. Uh, they, they, they are just like a tetrapod. Uh, like an amphibian, there's two, uh, uh, the, these things are fleshy and there's bones in them. They can move these things. Um, these things were thought to have been extinct back in 1938. One was caught off of Africa uh, in 1938. And so this is, we really was a major discovery. I have two species listed here, Latimeria chalumnae, Latimeria menadenensis. Uh, there's, a, there's a third one. Uh, this one is from the Comoros Island. The other one is uh, uh, off of Indonesia. And then there's one from the Indian Ocean that was recently found. So they're very unique anatomy. They've got these lobes. Uh, they have a notochord that serves the backbone. They have very thick cycloid scales, or in some cases, some people might call these cosmoid scales. They have two very heavy bony plates under the chin. They have a swim bladder, but it's filled with fat, not air. Because these things live on the bottom of the ocean, so they don't go up and gulp air. Uh, they actually just fill the swim bladder. The lung inside of it is filled with fat to give it buoyancy. They have a spiral valve in the stomach. When we talk about internal anatomy, that's sort of a throwback digestive structure that some sharks have and the paddlefish has. They have type 2a reproduction from what we talked about and they have a hinged head you see this is a hinge this occipital joint here they have a hinged head that allows their upper jaw to open up as well as their mandible to open down so they can open their jaw very very wide and they have an amphistylic jaw uh, here uh, that's the jaw style that they have and so they're primarily eating small fishes and squids. And they do have this suction inhalation. They do have this pipette feeding, but it's not as sophisticated as, as some of these other more derived fishes. So coelacanths are pretty awesome. These pectoral limb bones, they have a humerus, a radiant, and an ulna. So when you look at this fin here, it is just like your arm. The bones are in there. Um, it has wrist bones as well. It's, this is not ancestral, however, itself. It shares an ancestor with tetrapods, but itself is derived. Uh, they live oftentimes in volcanic, uh, volcanic underwater habitats with lava flows in caves. And so these yellow spots here show where some of the coelacanths have been caught. And so they're relatively deep. Depth is five to 800 feet. Most of them are six to 700 feet in depth. Uh, cave temperatures down here are actually, despite the depth, is actually kind of warm because of all the tectonic and volcanic activity. And they, they swim with headstanding behavior. I'm going to show you in a video here. But they sort of swim with their head pointed down and their tail up. And they actually have, similar to the, the, uh, the chondrichthys, they have electrosensitivity. They can sense electric currents 
through their head. And so a lot of times they point their head down if they're hunting because they use that electrical sense to find things below them. So distribution is restricted here to the Indian Ocean. And like I said, we've got uh, Chalumne is located here and Menadonensis is here. And then there's the Indian coelacanth is in the Indian Ocean here that was more recently discovered. So there's really three species I believe is the idea here. Um, and so that's where they've been found. So they're really cool relic fish. So here is a video of the coelacanth, a dive showing, you know, and you'll see that head standing behavior. Coelacanth's paired fins move as if it's walking through the water. Its distinct and powerful three-lobe tail is found on no other living creature on Earth. So that is the coelacanth. Uh, these things are also, they're pretty rare. Uh, not a lot of them are, are found and they're pretty big. Uh, they can be up to six feet long. So they're actually, they're pretty substantial size fish. So uh, they're really awesome. And again, these, these are literally legs. They're analogous to legs. So the coelacanth, family Latimeridae. The next family we'll talk about really uh, is subclass Dipnoi. And I've given you three families here, Lepidosirenae, uh, Protopteridae and Ceratodontidae. These are the lungfishes. And despite the fact that they're all lungfishes, the South American lungfish is quite different from the African lungfishes, which is also quite different from the Australian lungfish. So they all have lungs, but notice they've got quite a bit of different features. So the Australian lungfish has these like lobe-like legs, whereas the African lungfish has these, these long, arm-like appendages here. 
Uh, they are uh, African and the South American lungfish are a little bit more similar in this regard to uh, the, the, these appendages, uh, legs, if you will. And then here is an example of an ancient lungfish that, from the Devonian, again, uh, the age of fishes. And notice that these things have not really changed all that much. Uh, these things have uh, more of a, uh, what they call diaphysurcal caudal fin or a tail where the, the caudal fin comes all the way around the tail like this. Whereas the ancient forms from the fossil record had a heterocircle tail. And then more lobe-like fins, maybe more resembling say the coelacanth. But generally speaking, these things were quite similar and they have not changed since the Devonian. So hundreds of millions of years ago, 400 million years or more. These are also living fossils, just like the coelacanth. They are pretty much unchanged from what they, they, they were back uh, in the ancient times. They have autostylic jaws. They are physostomus, meaning that they have a swim bladder on the inside that's connected to the esophagus. That's what a physostome is. Swim bladder connected to the esophagus, meaning that these things can come to the surface and gulp air to breathe, hence the name lungfish. And this, this swim bladder is lined with a lot of surface area, so they do breathe with it. They have very large yolky eggs that they lay amongst the vegetation in Australia. In some cases, like the uh, African lungfishes, will build mud nests to lay their eggs in. And they typically spawn during the rainy season. So a lot of times these things are found in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, in Australia, in Africa, and they'll estivate during the dry season, and then when it starts to rain again, they come out and execute their reproductive cycle. So uh, these are the families here uh, of the lungfishes. And I'll emphasize that you don't necessarily need to know the difference between the, the, the different types, just that, it, that these families are in fact lungfish families. The Australian lungfish, uh, is the most ancestral of it. Again, it has these large lobed uh, fins, like flippers almost. It has a compressed long body, heavy cycloid, or sometimes they'll call them cosmoid scales. So very heavy armor. And again, going back to the trends of the ancient fishes being heavily armored, uh, these things are quite heavily armored. There's a single lung, uh, and they also have gills. So they have a lung in there, but they also have gills which makes them what we call a facultative air breather. Most of the time, these things are getting oxygen from the water, but if they need to, they can switch to air breathing. There is no larval stage. There's direct development, so similar to like, say, a hagfish or a lot of the, the chondrichthyan fishes. And these things do not estivate. We'll talk about estivation on the next slide. Max length, six feet, 110 pounds. These are the largest of the lungfish. So very much like flipper-like fins is what the key diagnostic here is with heavy armor. The America, uh, African and South American lungfishes uh, have larvae that have external gill tufts, kind of like newts. There's external gills like this that grow outside of the head as larvae, and then as they mature to adults, these go away and the, the gills then become enclosed entirely within the head. They have kind of reduced filamentous paired fins. So in the case of the, uh, the African lungfish, these things are quite long, whereas in the South American, they're very short. So shorter legs on the South American lungfish, longer ones on the African. Uh, they can lay up to 5,000 eggs uh, in mud cavities that are dug primarily by the males. The females will then come around and spawn in those nests, and then the males will guard the nest and then the, the larvae like this. They have compressed bodies, so long eel-like body. Small cycloid scales, to the point where you feel these things, it almost feels like it's skin. And so they don't have the heavy armor that the Australian lungfish has. These things have paired swim bladders or air bladders that are lungs, and they're obligatory air breathers. If you take these fish <clears throat> and put them in an aquarium and put a plate of glass on the top at the surface and do not allow these things to get to the air, they will drown. So there's a fact for you. Fish can in fact drown. And the African lungfish and the South American lungfish are two examples of that. They can survive lengthy droughts 
uh, and we've done some work on the African lungfish, but not really much is known about the South American lungfish in this regard. So the lengthy droughts, they survive by estivating. And so this is a term you might want to know for an exam. If I was a student studying, I might want to know this. Estivation. What these things do is they go into uh, estivation is, is like a hibernation, where what they'll do is they'll build a mud cocoon that they curl up into, and there's usually some shaft here that they can breathe out of, and this mud cocoon prevents them from drying out. So during the dry season, they'll dig these mud cocoons and estivate in there. And then the tube, then this hole at the top allows them to breathe. Um, metabolism of lungfish slows uh, and oxygen consumption is greatly reduced. And they basically burn fat and muscle for energy. Because of course they're not eating during this time. They're sort of in suspended animation. They store large amounts of urea in the blood as a metabolic waste product. And they don't, uh, they don't release that until they emerge again. They can actually survive in these cocoons for eight to 10 months and up to four years, people have had them in a laboratory. So they're very, they're very tough when they're in these, this state. When the rains come in the rainy season, it dissolves the mud cocoon and the lungfish will then emerge. It will rehydrate, drink water, and then it will eat, and then it will spawn. And a lot of times in the case of the African lungfish, the remnants of these mud cocoons is what they use to spawn into. It becomes a mud nest. So when they come out, they'll feed, and then that's where they lay their eggs down in this, uh, this mud cocoon. So here's a video showing lungfish and their estivation. This is actually a pretty interesting video. Southern Africa is home to a very primitive fish with some extraordinary abilities. It's the lungfish, and while it has gills like any other fish, it can also breathe air directly using a modified swim bladder that acts as a lung. When water levels are high, this isn't so important, but the rains will eventually fail, and the constant burning sun will dry up all the water. Fish are left flapping at the surface as the waters disappear. Only the air-gulping lungfish is able to cope with these extreme conditions, but it's still exposed to the heat and is still at risk from predators. So it relies on another, even more extraordinary ability. It finds a new, safer home buried underground. Digging down by eating mud and pushing it out through its gills, To stop it drying out, the lungfish exudes a special mucus from its skin, covering itself in a thick layer that hardens to form a waterproof cocoon. Only a single hole is left for breathing. Baked into this mud sarcophagus, the lungfish slows its metabolism to 1 60th of its original rate, relying on its muscles and body fat as a source of food and water. It becomes just another piece of hardened mud and lungfish have even been known to end up as an accidental brick in a mud hut wall. But this isn't the end for the lungfish. It can survive like this for an incredible four years. Eventually, it could end up poisoned by its own waste products. But in this case, the onset of the rains is its salvation. As the mud walls are washed away, the lungfish's hard mucus lining is softened. It's been four years since it last used its muscles, and they're very weak. But as it breaks free of this mud cocoon, it still manages to drag itself towards the nearest source of water. It's the ultimate survivor. And although it's underwater now, it'll soon be back in the mud, repeating the whole process again and again as the annual rains come and go. So the lungfish, are quite remarkable in their ability to estivate. <clears throat> so a suspended animation that they use to survive uh, poor conditions such as drought. So really very interesting creatures, lungfish. And you can see in the video that they're actually breathing. When they, you know, they, they, they breathe just like a, a terrestrial animal. So, 
Next family we'll talk about is family Polypteridae, the, the, the Bashir or the Bakir, often called the reed fish. And again, these are also in Africa, the African reed fishes. And here's a picture of one of these things. They're very characteristic. They're also a, a group of relict or living fossil fishes. Uh, very ancient, have not changed their body form in hundreds of millions of years. Uh, they have characteristics with several ancestral groups uh, along with some other unique characteristics. And so there's a series of these dorsal finlets. And so you can see these little finlets down the dorsal aspect of the fish here and also here, these little finlets. <clears throat> um, they have two lobe-like paired fins up here. You can sort of see this, the Bashir here is sort of standing up on those fins. And so these things can actually walk. And in some cases, they can be somewhat terrestrial. They're, they're not as, as free moving as the lungfish, but they actually can breathe a little bit of air. And so they can come out as long as they stay wet. And they can walk around on those fins. They respire through their gills in water at high oxygen concentrations, but their obligatory air breather is at low oxygen. So again, when their water is receding or is low dissolved oxygen, they can actually breathe uh, using their swim bladder. They have two lungs, just like the lungfish. That swim bladder is really a lung. Um, and they inhale air through their mouth, right here through their mouth, and then they have these spiracles on the side of the head. Now we haven't heard, of, we haven't heard about spiracles since we talked about chondrichthys, like sharks and rays and things. And so this is one of those bony fishes that in fact has spiracles. Uh, most of the other bony fishes do not. So that's actually a key characteristic here for the Bashir, family Polypteridae. They also have a, a gular plate, kind of like the coelacanth, these heavy bony plates underneath the, the jaw. So these bony plates here are the gular plates. And they have a ganoid scale, so very heavy armor. Uh, these things are, are heavily armored, again, talking about that ancient that ancient characteristic of the fishes. And they have a, a heteros, uh, they have an abbreviated heterocircle tail. So similar to the bowfin, they have sort of an upturn here uh, of, the, of the tail, so it's heterocircle. Not extreme like a, a, a lasmobranch shark, but it's got kind of an abbreviated heterocircle tail. They also have this crazy spiral valve in the intestine, which we'll talk about when we talk about digestion, but it's sort of an ancient digestive structure that allows the intestine to have more surface area. They're primarily located in freshwater swamps of Central Africa, so again, Sub-Saharan. Max length, four feet, 11 species, and these things lay eggs. They're oviparous egg layers. So here's a video of, of a bakir in an aquarium, and you can sort of see this thing feeding. It's a short video clip just showing how these things, and you can notice that they're their fins here, watch how they use them. So it's, it's eating here. And so you look at, they, they sort of can use those things as fins, but also when he goes to rest, he'll put them down like a pair of legs. And these are these finlets along the back, characteristic. And so these are the Bakirs. So another ancient, uh, another ancient fish. And that's that for the video. Um, family. Polypteridae. It's always an easy one for me. I just remember Polypteridae, the Bakir, and really those uh, spiracles and the heavy ganoid plates, the ganoid scales, and then the air breathing capabilities. So now we're going to talk about family Acipenseridae. <clears throat> These are in subclass Chondrosiae. So we were talking back here. Uh, also subclass Chondrosiae are ancient fishes. Family Acipenseridae are the sturgeons. And so an example here of uh, in North Carolina on the East Coast, of course, Acipenser oxyrhynchus, 
the Atlantic sturgeon, which is a federally endangered fish. Uh, most sturgeons in North America are now either threatened and or endangered. Uh, these are ancient things. They've got very heavy armor. Anyone who's touched one of these things, these, these bony plates here are pretty heavy and sharp and hard. So they're a relic fish also dating back 200 million years or so. These things have whisk, uh, these, these whisker-like barbells. Um, this, the nose of a sturgeon is called a rostrum. And these barbells then are on the underside of the rostrum. And these are for, these, these are for sensory uh, uh, tasting and smelling. These also have a spiracle right here behind the eye. The, the spiracle is uh, involved in, in, in a breathing apparatus. These things do not breathe air. They are, are uh, water breathers. There are five rows of these ganoid, what they call skeets, is the names of these plates. They also have this spiral valve in the stomach uh, to help with digestion, which is an ancient characteristic. They have a ventral mouth on the bottom of the head here because they primarily are feeding off the bottom. You can see the sturgeon's mouth right here on the ventral side. They were once an important fishery, but overfishing uh, has led to its collapse along with habitat modification. A lot of these things are anadromous, and so they live in the ocean and migrate into freshwater rivers to spawn, and uh, dams, for instance, have, have prevented their, or destroyed their spawning habitat. Uh, the meat is an important uh, commodity, but also the roe. Uh, caviar is a multi-billion dollar a year industry worldwide. And so these things are valued for the caviar as well as the meat, primarily in Europe, in, in uh, Russia. Uh, most Americans don't eat a whole lot of sturgeon meat, although sturgeon meat's actually not bad. But their populations have crashed, which led to their being listed as uh, endangered or threatened. So these are some of the reasons. Also, there's a very slow maturation here. These things live for many, many years, uh, decades. And so it takes them, uh, in the case of like say the Russian sturgeon, uh, just to reach sexual maturity is eight or more years. So they're a very long-lived species. Um, some of them are anatomous, but some also live landlocked in freshwater systems, for instance, the Great Lakes. Um, there are some freshwater sturgeons in the rivers, for instance, the pallid sturgeon and the, uh, the shovel nose sturgeon are from the Mississippi River freshwater. But um, most of the other major sturgeons, like the belugas, live in the Caspian Sea, uh, which is salt, it's a marine. And then they live in the, the, the Caspian Sea and then they spawn in freshwater rivers. So they're, again, kind of an adder. They lay eggs, they're oviparous. <clears throat> 24 species of sturgeons uh, in uh, family Acipenseridae. Diet is benthic, again, this benthic mouth. Uh, fish eggs, shrimp, clams, uh, insect larvae, crayfish, other small fishes, and then inverts, uh, mussels, barnacles, crabs, things like that. There are also marine and freshwater types. Northern hemisphere only, interestingly. You don't see a lot of sturgeons in the southern hemisphere. And most of them are protected, almost uh, really even worldwide. Most of these, these, these fish are, there's not really any fisheries out there that are, that are supporting active fishing of the sturgeons because they're so endangered. And so when we talk about the, uh, the value of these things, I'm gonna show you, a, a, I'm gonna show you something here online when we talk about the value. So this is from a website, Petrosian, is a famous caviar distribution out of Paris, France. Look at this, this little tin, 30 grams, serves one, $406. And so this is what we call special reserve Ocetra. Ocetra is the Russian sturgeon, uh, or also called the Persian sturgeon. And so Ocetra is the, 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 the official product name for that. Um, and that's Asapenser Gutenstaltai. 500 grams. Anyone wants to go out this weekend and, uh, you know, it'd be great if you could bring a present to class. You know, we could take 500 grams. It serves just enough for the class. You're 16. It's only $6,400, right? You want a kilogram? $12,000 for this caveat. So very expensive stuff. 
Um, and this is one type of the Russian sturgeon. Um, and so Petrosian is a, is a caviar distribution place. So that's sort of a, a, an example there of the, of the value of the sturgeons, the fishery. And then here's a short video on some uh, sturgeon research that, that I actually uh, am doing right now. So again, looking at caviar. Caviar, an expensive delicacy that has been around for hundreds of years, is strictly defined as the salt-cured rose of sturgeons, and we are studying Ocetra caviar, which comes from the Russian sturgeon. Sturgeons are widely recognized as endangered throughout the world. However, there remains a strong market demand for Ocetra caviar, which has led to its production by aquaculture. North Carolina Ocetra caviar, while delicious, is valued at a fraction of the price of international varieties. It may be that consumers desire particular subtle flavors in foreign caviars. Because caviar is salt cured, it is a living food. Raw sturgeon roe is mixed with salt and then allowed to age. The exact process is a trade secret. We are using scientific detective work to emulate and optimize this process. We have assembled a diverse collection of Ocetra caviars from around the world that retail from $60 an ounce to almost $600 an ounce. One aspect of our project is to characterize the microbial communities present in caviars using metagenomics. We have identified considerable variation in caviar microbial communities and we are working to understand these relationships along with other characteristics of the caviars, such as pH and osmolality. By understanding the ecology of these microorganisms, we can uncover the conditions for optimally growing them, which will provide a blueprint for how to best salt and age caviars here in North Carolina. We have already discovered an organism that is more common in the most expensive varieties. Now to grow it, study it, and to use this information to make better caviar. So that is one of the things that we're looking at is the caviar of the sturgeon and how to, to prepare it and to store it. So interesting stuff, the sturgeons. Another really interesting group of fishes, and again, it's family Asapenseridae. Another interesting group of fishes is family Polyodontidae, the paddle fishes. And I remember this one because Polyodon, poly means many, don is like dent, dental teeth, meaning many teeth. Polyodon means many teeth. And spathula, is the North American paddlefish, it means spatula. So Polyodon spathula is the species. Now this is, sadly, there used to be two species. It is now monotypic. Uh, there is one in the fresh waters of North America and there used to be one in the Yangtze River in China. However, it was declared extinct last year. Uh, so there's only one left. So this two species in family is now one only, sadly. So earlier this year, it was declared extinct. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So really we're looking at North American paddlefish. Also relic species. It has not changed for about a hundred million years. There's this, this paddle that extends out of the head with tiny barbells and all this, these little spots here are ampullary organs. They can sense electric currents just like a chondrichthyan fish uses its ampullae of Lorenzini to do so. It's largely naked. There are no scales on it at all. And it does have a spiracle here on its head. It has a spiral valve in its gut, which is a throwback. Huge opercular openings here. This looks a lot like those filter feeding chondrichthyan fishes. Uh, water comes in through the open mouth here and then filter feeds and then passes through. And so I said that the paddlefish looks a lot like some of those filter feeding chondrichthyan fishes. 
Populations that plummeted do the same reasons as sturgeon. You know, hey, when, when, when you can't harvest these things for the eggs to make caviar, what's the next best thing? Let's harvest paddlefish eggs and make uh, caviar out of the paddlefish. Uh, and so a lot of these things are considered endangered or threatened, or in some cases, unfortunately, extinct. They can get pretty big, 10 feet, 1,500 pounds. Uh, so it's a pretty good size freshwater fish. Um, and so again, filter feeding, uh, mostly in rivers, the paddlefish family polyoed out today. And really we're looking at the Mississippi River drainage. So uh, west of the Appalachian Mountains in the Mississippi River. And then that's extant and the Yangtze River in China is extinct in 2020. So Here's an article that talks about that um, here. Um, and this was from the Smithsonian. So Chinese paddlefish, which lived for 200 million years is now extinct. So the freshwater species likely disappeared sometime between 2005 and 2010. Uh, again, due to human activity. So this is habitat modification and things like that. Uh, dams on the rivers, water pollution, channelization, things like that. Here is a specimen of a Chinese paddlefish that was uh, collected in 1990 on display here at the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Wuhan, China. Um, and unfortunately, that's all that's left. And so it's the Yangtze River is the third largest river. Uh, the paddlefish were here and it says the uh, used to be common in the region over a decade of surge or, uh, searching. Researchers say the species completely disappeared sometime between 2005 and 2010. The last known sighting was in 2003. And so no one has seen a paddlefish since. And so it was reported, the article date here is January 10th, 2020, was uh, the, the paddlefish was unfortunately declared extinct in China. So all we have left is the North American population. So here's a video then showing uh, fishing for paddlefish snag because again it's a filter feeder so you're not baiting a hook and having it bite it you're actually having to snag these things because they're filter feeders and so here's a video there showing uh, how to fish for paddlefish Hi, I'm Dick Ferro. We just had uh, quite an experience fishing for some paddlefish. It's it's a very unique way of fishing. You don't catch them in the sense that uh, you put bait out there. You have to snag them, and boy, is that a thrill! You have to have a fairly heavy weight below the uh, a large treble hook, which you call a gang hook. Uh, the weight is to get the uh, the hook down close to the bottom where these fish usually stay, and then you just yank it along. I feel like a snag. Uh, these fish are huge. You get one on, you don't know where they're going to be hooked. So once you get one on, uh, you might have them hooked anywhere from the head to the tail, anywhere in between, which makes you bringing them in a real challenge, especially when you're fishing these rivers where the you got the current working with you as well. So I uh, caught a couple. We rolled out for a couple of hours, and in that short period of time, had uh, two nice ones on, one in the upper 20s that was a male, and then I caught that big female that was uh, almost 38 pounds, 37, 38 pounds. So a really big fish took me forever to get that fish in. That is a lot of work, but boy, what a thrill. I really, really enjoyed it. The paddlefish program that the wildlife department has come up with is, is absolutely phenomenal. They are processing large numbers of fish. It's helping them with their management decisions. They're learning a lot about the fish because of the data they're acquiring. Uh, but it's also win-win and that it's also pro uh, meeting a need, uh, providing the meat for the fishermen that they, they fillet out for the fishermen. And then, of course, with the caviar that they get from it, it turns out there's quite a market for that. So the more than pays for itself. It's very expensive to manage these populations in this way. Uh, our fishermen are bringing in the product. You kind of make invest them as part of the uh, data collection. Uh, they bring it to us. We flay that out very nice, return it to them. And if it has eggs, then we process those eggs into caviar and sell them on the international market. So that is the, the paddlefish family, Polyodon today. Very interesting fish. All right, here is our pointer. All right. Next family, uh, Lepizo Lepizostidae, the gars. And so here's your example, Lepizostius osseus, uh, the long-nosed gar. And again, uh, Lepi Lepiz Lepizostius means scale bone. Uh, these things are very heavily armored. Um, 
And so another relic fish dating back 225 million years or more, these things are relatively unchanged since that time. Uh, the family has long jaws with many needle-like teeth. And so these things eat other fish. Long slender body covered with thick, hard ganoid scales. Anyone who's tried to clean a gar, uh, you have to use a hacksaw and pliers and things like that. These things are very heavily armored. They've also got this abbreviated heter heterocircle tail where the, the, the top lobe of the caudal fin sort of bends up a little bit. Uh, remnant spiral valve in the stomach. And again, you see the spiral valve is an indicator of a less derived fish because it was a structure that was uh, very popular hundreds of millions of years ago. You don't see these things in, in modern fishes like a large mouth bass. They do have a lung-like air bladder. Uh, and so they're a physostome. The swim bladder connects to the esophagus and they can gulp air in and they can use this for a little bit of breathing. So gars can actually be located in backwaters like uh, where they're barely covered in water and they can actually breathe air. Entirely ossified skeleton, so they're fully bony. Oviparous egg laying. The, the fish, you know, we talk about fish like this, the, 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 the paddlefish and the sturgeon, you've got the eggs are worth a lot of money, right? They're very valuable as caviar. I would not eat the eggs. I would not eat gar caviar because the eggs are actually poisonous. Uh, they include toxins, and I guess it's a defense mechanism to have prevent other species from eating their eggs. And so do not eat the eggs of a gar. Uh, it can make you sick. Seven species, all North America, freshwater, really Mississippi River drainage. Uh, and so we have the gars here in North America. Uh, max size 10 foot 300 pounds with the alligator gar. Uh, these things can get pretty large like this one right here. And they're actually one of the larger freshwater fishes. The, along with the sturgeons get pretty big and the paddlefish get pretty big. Diet mostly is bony fishes. Again, they've got these needle like teeth that they use to catch these things. So these are the gars, heavily armored, uh, family uh, Lepizostidae. Another relic species, family Amiidae, the bowfin, a uh, single species. It's what we call monotypic. Uh, one species, Amia calva, again, North America, primarily Mississippi River drainage and also some of the Great Lakes. Uh, Amia calva means the bald head. Uh, these things actually don't have scales on their head. And so this is the bowfin, uh, Amia. Uh, dates back, again, unchanged relatively 225 million years ago. Again, if you look at the caudal peduncle here, we have this abbreviated heterocircle tail with a round caudal fin. So abbreviated heterocircle tail. The dorsal fin extends all the way down the length of the body. And I'm going to show a video here of a bow fin swimming. They actually use this dorsal fin to generate a lot of forward momentum. They can also back up. They can swim backwards with it. And I'll show you how they do that. They have a single median gular plate. So at the bottom uh, underneath their lower jaw, they have a single bony plate, kind of like the Bakir uh, in the coelacanth. It's a heavy bony plate here. They have a remnant spiral valve in the stomach. Again, it's a throwback digestive apparatus. They have a vascularized air bladder. And again, it's physostomus. The swim bladder attaches to the esophagus. They can breathe air in and they can get oxygen out of the air. So these things also can breathe air. Um, they have, you see this blue mouth. Uh, these are breeding males. Uh, when the males are breeding, they'll actually get a blue to green mouth here. And you can see that the, the teeth here, this is a piscivore. Uh, these things eat other animals. Large mouth with recurved teeth. Uh, and this is, allows them to really uh, trap and engulf prey. They do have some suction feeding uh, that they can do, but the teeth are there for biting and chomping. Max size, about three and a half feet, 20 pounds. Males construct the nests in the spring, about one and a half feet in diameter. And then the males will court females uh, and the nest then will, you know, two to 5,000 eggs will be laid in there. And then the male will guard that nest. 
until the fry are about four inches long. So the males will, will offer parental care there. And so uh, they're, fine, they're, they're found in fresh waters, primarily swampy backwaters of Eastern United States. And again, in the Mississippi River system. You know, you, a lot of times you find these things on the ditches on the side of the road and they can actually tolerate some pretty terrible water quality. Um, and so a lot of times swamps and backwaters. So here's a video showing a bowfin swimming. And note the dorsal fin here. Pay attention to the dorsal fin and how it sort of moves that dorsal fin because that's sort of the characteristic. That very long dorsal fin. Oh, and, and I forgot to mention the spot on the tail by the caudal fin. that dorsal So that is the uh, the bowfin, and again, these things are relatively unchanged for a long period of time—225 million years. And again, I was going to say this: this spot here on the the the, the caudal peduncle is another characteristic. So a very long uh, dorsal fin, uh, cycloid scales, so fairly heavily armored. Again, with that gular plate. So that is the bowfin family Amiidae, monotypic, one species. So what we're going to talk about Thursday are, are, the, are what we call the teleos. So what I just did right there was I just ripped through this right here. We went through the dipneustii, the lungfishes, costopterygii, the, uh, the coelacanth. Uh, the Bakirs are here, the Polypteridae, Chondrostei includes Acipenser, uh, Sturgeons, we just talked about the Gars, uh, Lepizostidae, and then Amiaformes, Amiidae, the Bofin. So we just talked about that right there. And the uh, Chondrostei is also the paddlefish. Now we're going to spend the rest of our lectures on taxonomy talking about Teleos. There's 35 orders of teleos. That is most of the living fishes. Notice I even said there's only one species of bowfin, seven species of guards, a few species of sturgeons, uh, there's a hand, like a dozen species of bashirs, uh, one paddlefish is left. There, you know, there's not a lot of these things, but we're talking about a lot of diversity here when we're moving into teleos. Teleos uh, is the next group that we'll talk about. So when we talk about the teleos on Thursday, these are the primary considerations. The first is this, they're what we call modern bony fishes. We were talking about osteichthys at the beginning of the class, osti, bone, ich, fish. The teleos are modern bony fishes. So not these relics that have been around for 200 something million years, but more recent stuff. There's 23,000 species. 96% of all living fishes are teleos. And that's why I said, if you had to guess what division a group of, if I gave you a random fish and I said, what division is this? If you just guessed teleos, it probably is right, just based on this. There are more species of teleos than all other vertebrate classes combined. 
and they occur in all aquatic habitats of the world. They've been widely adapted. Warm temperature, cold temperature, uh, all sorts of stuff. Latitudinal, uh, uh, freshwater, saltwater, et cetera. And so here are two primary structural innovations. And again, we talked about Romer's hypothesis and the evolution of jaws. And we talked about the ancient placoderms and uh, these ancient heavily armored fishes. Uh, and even these ones that we just talked about today, a lot of them had heavy armor, like the sturgeon had ganoid plates. When we look at teleos, these are the two things we're talking about. <laughs> two primary innovations. Feeding mechanism. So we said that early on, the first fishes that evolved jaws put all the agnathan jawless fishes out of business. Well, what we're seeing here is the diversity here is not only do we have jaws, but we've basically designed it for this very advanced sectorial feeding with a protrusible mouth. This is a lot more sophisticated than say the long beak-like jaws of a gar. The second is locomotion. Let's get rid of the ganoid scales, let's get rid of the heavy armor, and let's put on light armor and just really do fast swimming. Uh, we don't need to worry about armor if we can evade a predator, for instance. And so these are the two primary uh, mechanisms by which these fishes evolved their diversity. Advanced feeding mechanism and very agile, fast locomotion. And so those are the two primary innovations that teleos have. So when we say pipette feeding, you know, we told their chondrosteans, like the sturgeons and things like that. Uh, the jaws are fused to the skull, the holosteans, uh, uh, the jaws free from the, 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 the cheek, and these are the, the less derived fishes we already talked about today. The teleosts, highly maneuverable jaw. We talked about this. When this mouth opens, when this mandible drops down, we see this maxilla push forward and the pre-maxilla extend out. So that mouth opens and extends forward. Powerful directed negative pressure that is created in the buccal cavity. Look at this fish here. Look how far the mouth of that fish can extend out to, to eat that insect. It can extend out uh, a, a considerable amount. That's what we say protrusible. And at the same time, it's creating a vacuum suction pressure. These things also have a second jaw on the inside of the skull that has pharyngeal teeth. And so there's a second jaw in here. You've got your oral jaw that's designed like this, and then you've got a pharyngeal jaw that's on the inside that's designed to crush things, like the molars on your jaw are designed to crush them. So uh, again, part of this evolving feeding apparatus. This allows for a variety of different feeding mechanisms. You know, we see herbivores, we see carnivores, we see omnivores, we see everything in between. Uh, lots of different specializations. There. This is the explosive radiation that we're talking about. So lots of divergence, lots of radiation. Also, <clears throat> we talk about locomotion. Here's a sturgeon, what we call pre teleost right? This is a teleost, this is a largemouth bass. These things sort of have a swim bladder, kind of uh, not really developed. A lot of these ancient fishes, if they did have a swim bladder, most of the time they were using it to breathe air. Uh, and so if you look at the fin placement here, you've got this pectoral fin, and then you've got this heterocircle tail on a sturgeon. What this does is, is as this fish swims forward in the water column, these fins design are designed to give it lift. Now, this looks just like an airplane from the side, right? An airplane has the exact same tail and it has these wings. And all it does is it pushes through the air and then the wings are designed to give it lift, which is why the plane can fly. This fish is designed just like an airplane, right? So we call this, uh, this heterocircle tail with these pectoral, these plowing pectoral wings uh, is just this airplane design. This is because as this fish swims through the water column, it gives it lift so it doesn't sink to the bottom. Now, this largemouth bass is a teleost. We have now a more sophisticated swim bladder. Again, heavily armored, 
light armor. And in addition to reducing our density by getting rid of armor, we now have a swim bladder that's designed to give us buoyancy. And so there's a, there's a sac enclosed inside of this fish that's not designed to breathe air, but it's designed to provide lift, which means that this fish can then focus more of its body on muscle, which then allows it to swim even faster. So this thing will swim faster than this thing here. So uh, anterior is independent of posterior. What that means is, is that this fish here, in order for it to get lift, its tail has to work with its pectoral fin. They're linked. This thing has a swim bladder in it, which means the tail, all it's doing is providing thrust and the fins here are then designed to steer, right? And so these are not linked. So this fish is more agile as well as more, more fast. And again, loss of the heavy armor, development of the swim bladder, this allows neutral buoyancy. The fish can move horizontally without a vertical component. Again, in order for this thing to get lift, it's got to swim forward. This thing can literally swim in 360 degrees. Uh, very agile, very fast. And so teleost major uh, adaptations that allow for radiation. And then um, another uh, one that I covered in the lab was fin placement and structure. We look at a less derived fish as a sturgeon versus a more derived fish like a bluegill. Again, sunfish, family centrarchidae. Again, we've got our pectoral fins here with our heterocircal tail. Oftentimes we have an elongate dorsal fin, uh, soft rays, there's no hard spines in here. Also, also, our pelvic fins are located way back here. So this is anterior, this is posterior. Pelvic fins are located posterior. Here's a more derived fish. Here's our pectoral fin, here's our pelvic fin. They're located right next to each other. That is a derived characteristic. Pelvics and pectorals are located next to each other. Again, it gives the fish more agility in its ability to steer. Uh, also, a lot of these fishes had greater body depth, which means it's harder for a predator to eat them. This is a nice, long, skinny fish. This is a very deep-bodied fish. It's harder to swallow this thing whole. And also, in a, it, this is only soft spines. These guys here have soft rays here, but the anterior part of this dorsal fin is fully loaded with hard spines, and these are for defense. This is a defense mechanism because nobody wants to bite down on this because it will hurt the inside of your mouth. So it's a defense mechanism. So that's another primary characteristic. We don't have a lot of heavy armor here, no heavy ganoid scutes, but we do have needle-like teeth and we can swim fast and hopefully not get eaten. So that's sort of the strategy there that Teleos had evolved. And it looks like it worked pretty good. You know, we got 20 something thousand species. So my guess is that that was pretty successful uh, betting evolutionary odds on that. So with that, I have a story about the lungfish. And so this is one of your, you learned it here, AEC 441, African lungfish. Now, the lungfish, again, uh, genus Protopteris, um, is native to the waters of Uganda, uh, primarily Lake Victoria. But populations are rapidly declining, and the species is now, I'd say, endangered, threatened, uh, because of overexploitation, environmental degradation, and large scale conversion of wetlands into agricultural lands for farming. So here's a picture of a lungfish. And these things are actually consumed in Africa. They're, uh, they're, they're eaten, they're, they're a food. And so lungfish contributes about 4% to the national food production. So about 4% of the population, or 4% of the seafood consumed in Uganda is lungfish. The majority is either Nile perch or tilapia. Uh, transportation to market from harvest sites uh, in Lake Victoria is often done with a uh, lungfish being processed and then sun dried to preserve them. And the human consumption of lungfish varies by population. So the Luo people occasionally eat the lungfish. But the Sukuma 
avoid eating the lungfish because quote unquote, the taste is considered locally either highly appreciated or strongly disliked. So what that means is like, well, taste, it, it, it's okay. That sort of means that you either like it or you don't. And so it must have a very strong flavor profile. We worked on these things. I never ate them uh, because apparently uh, it's, a, it's kind of a custom there that you do not go to restaurants to eat the lungfish. They're, you have to prepare them in your house yourself. You can buy them at the seafood market, but you have to cook them in your own house. Uh, the restaurants do not sell them. So we are working to establish husbandry methods for lungfish aquaculture in Uganda to help provide reliable food supply and also prevent it from becoming extinct. So here I am, we're dissecting this lungfish here in Uganda. Um, and that's one of the lungfish we are looking at. So that's pretty cool. We've done some work with lungfish um, and also then for the culture of lungfish uh, as a food source. So. I have uh, something to show you here, a real brief thing on, on, on Facebook here. This is my Facebook site here. These are some of the, the places we stayed at when we were in Uganda. So these grass huts here. This was actually a panoramic shot I took off of the, uh, the balcony of one of the places I was staying. This is the African savanna out there. Like if you go outside of this wall, a, a lion's going to eat you. So the lungfish are out there in like Lake Edward, Lake George, uh, Lake Victoria. And so we're out there sampling these things. And here is a picture of one of these lungfish there. It's a pretty good size, but this is a scalpel there to give you a, a scale there. This is one of the lungfish that they had caught off of, I think, Lake Vecina. Um, and they, we brought it up to sample it. And so these are some of the, the, the our research team here. I always like to show this, uh, you know, these are there are sampling group uh, from Uganda that were that sampling the lake. And then also to say that like when we're out there, this is a centrifuge. We're collecting blood, putting out liquid nitrogen, and it's manpower here spinning this around to centrifuge the blood. So it's pretty cool doing the field work out in uh, Africa. These guys were a bunch of great guys. I love working out there. And so and again, talk about something killing you while you're sampling your fish, you know, hippos and things like that. It's pretty dangerous, I'd say. So there's that uh, uh, with the lungfish. And then I'd like to show you this here. I do have this Facebook website, uh, the Striped Bass Genome Community, and we post a lot of photos and stories and things like that about our research. Um, and so, for instance, when we were saying that Linnea was helping to weigh in Michael Jordan's marlin, uh, there, there's, there's MJ right there with the marlin, and here's the, the marlin in the bed of the truck with Linnea. So pretty cool stuff. We post stories and things on here in particular about striped bass, um, but not necessarily, sometimes other things. So if you'd like to follow that, we, we try to post some interesting stories there. And so with that, um, that's all I have for today's lecture. Um, the lungfish and uh, that is it. So next time we'll be talking about teleos and these advanced body designs and how they have greatly contributed to explosive radiation uh, among the fishes. So with that, I'm going to stop recording.